Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's working. Hello, everyone. <laughs> right, great to see you all this morning. Um, if you're still coming in, there's lots of seats this side. If you're just walking in the door, um, please do come over this way. There's um, there's a whole number of spare seats over here, so uh, don't feel like you have to sit at the back. Come and join us near the front. Great, well welcome everyone, welcome to Broadme Baptist Church. It's lovely to see you all here this morning. My name's Jay and I'll be um, taking us through the um, first part of today's service. Just a couple of things to say is um, home groups are on this week, um, so if you're part of a home group then please do make sure you uh, prioritise that and if you're not part of a home group then please do speak to John uh, who's over there and he'd love to, to point you in the, the right direction for which home group you could be part of. The second thing I just want to say, which I think there's a notice for, uh, for band night, um, because that's coming up this week. Um, if you're in the band or you're interested in getting involved in the band, um, then band night is here this Friday. Um, the slides is coming round. It's slow, but it's coming. Uh, it's at seven o'clock uh, and there is food um, provided as well. If you're interested in going to band night, then please speak to Dylan, who's on the bass guitar today, uh, and he, uh, he'd love to talk to you and give you more details. But 7 o'clock this Friday, band night. Well, let me just um, read a few verses from Psalm 95, as we just still our minds and our hearts, and as we come before the Lord. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's pray together. Father, we do just thank you for, for a new day that you have made. Lord, we thank you that you know us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are a holy God. You are a great God. You are the great King above all gods. Thank you, Lord, that you formed the earth. You formed the mountains and the seas. And you formed us, Lord, you know how many hairs are on our heads. And we just pray that this would move us to come and bow down in worship this morning, to kneel before the Lord, our maker, for you are our God. Father, may we just be filled with your spirit today, a spirit of rejoicing, a spirit of knowing that you are for us, not against us. And we just pray now as we sing together, Lord, may it just be such a joyful time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, a few songs together. We're going to um, sing songs of rejoicing. Uh, we're going to sing songs of uh, saying, Jesus, you are mine and I need no more than you. That is what we are here together to do, to proclaim this gospel of Jesus Christ and that he is ours and he is all we need. So let's stand and let's sing these together. Come and stand before your Maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the One who holds the heavens and commands the stars above, is the God who bends to bless. 
bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. We are children. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, God with sacrificial blood. Bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the of your King and with trembling rejoice all our sickness all our sorrows Jesus carried up the hill he has walked this path before us he is walking with us still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to praise there is blessing in the battle so take heart and stand amazed rejoice when you cry to Christ 
his name above and noise his voice is clear my hold as Father, we do just want to proclaim your greatness and proclaim how good you are. 
And Lord, as we stand here as, as one, united in you, we want to praise you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, please do have a seat. And if you are a young person, if you'd consider yourself as a young person, would you like to come and sit on the floor, um, just on the, on the brownie part? And I'm going to invite Clark up. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Carol, if you come up as well, great. Let's, let's, yeah, that's the one, James. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, one of those. Oh, Carol, nice to see you. Thank you very much. Hey, children. Yeah, yeah just like that. That's great. Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, no, that'll work. Great. Here you go, mate. Get out of here. Where do you, here, I'll give you this one, James. Oh, oh, hey, guys. So, children, I wonder, do you guys enjoy building things? Yeah. Yes. What kind, of, what kind of things do you build? Have you, ever, have you ever built a fort at home before with duvets and pillows? Have you ever built, built things with your toys? Yeah. It's so much fun, isn't it, to, to build things? And my friends, James and Carol, they're, they're helping us to, to build a tower because... You see, the adults, children, we've been reading in the Bible in, um, about these guys called Ezra and Nehemiah. And these guys have been building, rebuilding a wall around Jerusalem. And it can be really fun to, to build things, but we always want to know what our friends think of our building. So I'm going to ask Lindsay what she, what she makes of it. Lindsay, what do you think of our building? What on earth are you guys building? Even if a fox climbed up it, it would just come crashing down your cardboard tower. It's a very specific insult, isn't it? <laughs> well, guys, don't, don't worry. Keep, keep going. You're doing a really, really good job. You're doing a really good job. What, where's Alvin? Alvin, what do you think? You call that a tower? That's rubbish. <laughs> guys, keep going. I think it looks great. So, children, it can be really difficult when, when people don't like what we're building. And it's really hard to, to keep going. And that's what Ezra and Nehemiah found as well. And as we're going to hear in our passage, they encouraged each other by saying, don't fear them, remember God. Don't fear them, remember God. So, we're going to keep messing around with our tower for a second. But, children, I've got a challenge for you guys. Later on, after you've been to your groups, you see, Ezra and Nehemiah were a long, long time ago. And it's been a long time to us now. So I want each of you guys, after the service, to ask your parents, how do we as Christians keep building when we have a hard time? And let's see if your parents have, will, will listen to Mark's sermon and be able to give you a good answer. <laughs> All right. Can we give a round of applause for our helpers? So we're, it's, we're at a time at, at the year, really, September, the church kind of runs on an academic year as opposed to a, a calendar year, and um, September seems like a good time for people to often uh, kind of start serving in the church in a, in a, more, in a, much, in a fuller way, or maybe uh, st uh, take some time off from serving a church uh, a and do something else for a little while. And um, Kate, would you mind coming up real quick? Kate has been serving us here as church secretary for how long? Three years. Three years. And three years is just about long enough that Kate can put up with me. <laughs> no, Kate is but, but even a wonderful, wonderful church secretary. Kate is very good is that she sees things that we don't see. And she sits there in meetings and says, yes, but what about that? And I look at my watch and say, okay. <laughs> And, but Kate has been faithfully serving not only the, the trustees of the church, 
but she's been serving as a deacon, and she's been leading the diaconate uh, uh, as church secretary. And Kay, we're, we're so grateful to God for you. You have a wonderful heart to, to serve him. And I want to tell you, you've got a wonderful calling on your life. And Kate is not just leaving one thing. She's embracing an, another area of ministry uh, that God has prepared for her. And I want you to know that we love you, and we're going to be praying with you uh, through that new area of ministry, and we're going to be supporting you in that every way we possibly can. Thank you so much for all you've done for the church. And let's give a round of applause, please. Thank you. Please stay here. Can you stay for a minute? Yes. And Ola and Sarah, can you come up? Uh, Ola, and, Ola and Sarah and, and Kathy and I have been friends for over 20 years, since they were teenagers and we were in our 30s. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when BC3 was without a building, when we were kind of homeless, um, my son was being mentored by Ola, and he was there mentoring my son, and my son told Ola about the situation. He said, well, you know what? Come and meet in my office. I'm the boss, and I can decide who meets in my office. And for eight months, how long was it? About, about eight months, he rocked up every Sunday morning at nine o'clock and opened up his office for us so we could be there. And um, over the years, Ola has uh, moved into many areas of leadership. He served as an elder. He has served as the, uh, the cha chair of the chapel trust, chair of the trustees. And the thing with Ola is every, every time there's a, a problem, something that needs doing, he puts his hands up and says, I'll do that. I'll do that. And we, I, personally, we love you so much. And the as a church, we love you so much. And as we've been praying with you, we, our heart is to see what God has for you uh, in the next 10 years. As, as the boys leave and take all the money. <laughs> As the boys leave and take all the money, um, we, we're going to see what God's going to do through your ministry. And so they're going to be taking some time to sabbatical, uh, some time to pray and to remember and to, to think about what God has for them. And we want to support you in that. But most of all, just say thank you. Thank you both for all you've done. Sarah, thank you for your cheerful, lovely smile and the way you welcome people. Thank you, Ola, for your faithful, loving ministry. We just we're so grateful to God for you. I think there's something. He wants to start talking now. No. <laughs> I just want to say a massive thank you that you have allowed me to serve in this. It's been a, a real honor to, to be part of the eldership, to, to lead you. I thought five years seemed like a long time, and it's gone like a flash. And it's been so humbling and, and, and a blessing. It's been a joy, and I thank you, and we thank you for, for allowing us to serve you guys in this way. Thank you. Stay here for now. Let's, um, let's pray for these guys now. Father, thank you so much that you bless us with people. Um, thank you so much for blessing us with Kate. Lord, we praise you for her. Thank you for her kindness, her warmth. Thank you for her, her sharpness, uh, for her, her wisdom. Thank you for her organizational capacity and grace. Thank you for her pastoral care for, um, for the deacons. Um, and Lord, thank you for the way that she's, um, she's made us do things better as a church. And Lord, we, we pray that you'd bless her richly. We pray that she would know your presence very close to her as she starts this new chapter, um, and we pray that you would, um, yeah, that you'd cause her to flourish, that she would be, um, yeah, that she'd, she would know you very close to her. Um, and Father, we, yeah, we, we thank you so much for her, and we pray that um, we would, um, yeah, we would love her well, uh, and that, um, yeah, and that she would, she would know the, the support and the care of church family um, as she moves on to the next chapter. In the name of Jesus, amen. And Father, we, we praise you for Ola as well, Lord. Thank you so much for him. Thank you so much for his, his years of service. Thank you for yeah, his generosity um, and the way he, he gives and keeps on giving. 
Um, and thank you for, yeah, the, the memories we have of, of meeting in his office uh, all those years ago. Um, and thank you so much for, yeah, his, his wisdom and his practical know-how um, in the chapel trust and in, as a trustee and on the eldership. And Lord, thank you so much for his spiritual insight and, and wisdom. And Lord, thank you so much for Sarah as well. Thank you so much for her, yeah, her, her prayer life, for her, her wisdom and her, her gifting. And Lord, we pray for them as they, as they think about their future, as they, um, as they pray. Lord, speak to them really clearly, we pray. We pray that you would be um, their, their rock and their refuge um, and that you would show them the, the path that they should walk in. And Lord, we know that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And we pray that that would be something they can really hold on to um, and know to be true in their experience. And, and we praise you for, for Ola and Sarah and for Kate. And, and, and we thank you that you provide um, people and you bless us with them. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I stay here. Stay, stay, stay. Uh, Noah. So, Noah, uh, we praise God for you, and we're so thrilled. Noah is, is going to be serving the church part-time, uh, leading a youth ministry, a ministry primarily to 14 to 18-year-olds. And he's going to be doing that through studies, uh, Bible studies. He's going to be doing that through um, activities, w along with a, a strong team. If you are aged 14 to 18, I want you to listen to me right now. No, no, I'm <laughs> uh, School years, year 10 to year 13. Oh, okay. So <laughs> no, it's, it's, what's that? Year three of secondary school for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if you're aged 14 to 18, please listen to me, because I want to tell you one thing. I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, sorry, it's not 14 to 18. <laughs> school years, year 10 to year 13. <laughs> If you are aged 14 to 18, <laughs> all right, school years 10 to 13. School years 10 to 13. If you're in that age bracket, I want to tell you one thing you may not know and three things you don't know you need. One thing you may not know, God has a plan for your life. God has something he wants you to do. He's got something he wants you to, where he's, place, place he wants you to go. He's got people that you want, he wants you to help and build up. He's got a direction for your life. And when you're in years 10 to, 13. 10 to 13, that is the time when you start to understand the wonderful things that God has for you. One thing you may not know. Three things you don't know you need. Firstly, you need to be part of a group of people who are going in the same direction. You need to be part of a group of people who are sharing with you that journey who are walking with you, who are encouraging you. You cannot do this on your own. Secondly, you need to have a, 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 a group, um, you need to have leaders in your group who are able to speak to you personally and encourage you and watch over you and guide you and direct you and be your friends and mentors. Thirdly, you need to be... Uh, understanding that what we say here in church is not just in church, but it is actually the best way to live. And you need someone to teach that to you. You need someone to, to, to model that for you. You need someone to walk that journey with you. You need to be part of the youth ministry of this church. You need to sacrifice other activities, other, whatever else you want, and be part of that ministry because it is incredibly important for you, whether you realize it or not. Mom and dad, if you have a child who is in years... 10 to 13. 10 to 13. You need to be encouraging them to come. If they're sitting at home on their phone, you need to say, put your phone away now, we're going to youth ministry. Put your phone away, we're going to youth work. Get involved, stay involved. They need you to be doing, making that decision for them. They need you to be encouraging them in that decision. Because when you're a young person, there's many, many other things that you're interested in. So mother and father, the church is providing Noah to serve you. Take advantage of that ministry. Encourage your children to be part of that ministry. 
and support that ministry because God has provided Noah for that ministry. Okay? Dylan. Sorry, Jay. I know. <laughs> well, the church has, uh, has, uh, has asked Dylan uh, and, uh, to serve us as an elder. Uh, and to, he's, he's now on, a, on this journey as an elder with the church. He and his lovely wife, Hannah, already served God in so many ways. Uh, Dylan may not be the oldest elder that we've ever appointed, uh, but I tell you what, he, he, he's one of the most mature guys I've ever met. Dylan loves Jesus. He loves God's people. He loves serving them. He prays for people. He cares for them. He's going to be looking out for our home groups. And I want you, you as a church to honor Dylan and Hannah and encourage them and make their job a joy because they care for you and they're serving God on your behalf. So, fellas, can you just go down here and we'd like to ask you also to join and pray and um, other elders and leaders who would like to join us. Um, we wanna, and uh, we'll just have a couple of people pray. Um, Ola, if you wouldn't mind. Dear beloved Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you that you raise up leaders and guides within your people to forward your message to the world and to the church. And we thank you for Noah and Dylan that they are stepping up right now and just taking on that amazing responsibility, knowing full well that there will be opposition and the enemy's arrows will be aimed directly at them, but they are willing to step in. So we pray right now, Father, that you would equip them. You would guide them and uphold them. You will hedge them in with your truth and your joy. Lord, Father, bless them now and bless the ministry and bless the church through that ministry. We worship you, Lord, Father, and in both in heart and in what we do. And we pray that that work that they have been called to do will be a true worship. Father, we lay them before you now and ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we just praise you so much for, for Dylan and Hannah. We just pray your blessing on them. Thank you that, for the loving care that they provide for so many people in this church. Strengthen them, keep them, encourage them, and uh, lead them on with happy ministry and, and wonderful joy. Pray for Noah, Lord. We thank you, Father, for his love for God's people, his love for the, for the young people. And I pray, Father, that you will bless his ministry and help him to build a strong team around him and to have an effective uh, role in raising up men and women of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Great, thanks very much. Well, now is the time for the children and young people to leave. Um, so the smaller ones, so Crash and Sparkle as you're going this side through the doors. And the older ones connect and explore, you're going up the stairs. And whilst they do that, why don't you turn to the person next to you, um, say hello to them, um, and then we're going to pray together in just a moment.
Okay, if you'd like to um, draw your conversations to a close, um, we're going we're gonna to turn our minds now um, to a time of prayer. Please do continue those conversations afterwards. Um, Lindsay's going to pray for us, and then we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord, for your goodness, your holiness, and your grace. Thank you so much, Lord, for all of the small and big blessings that you grant us every single day. Um, Lord, we thank you so much for your beautiful creation. We thank you for the sun yesterday. Um, and we also thank you, Lord, for the wedding of Angus and Leone yesterday. Um, and we pray for the start of their married life, that you would be so central to all that they do um, and that they can serve you wholeheartedly as a new family. Thank you for those little glimpses um, of heaven that you give us, Lord, um, when you show us these representations of your love in a marriage um, and the joy that it will be to be with you in eternity. Thank you, Lord, for your word and how you have led us through one year of our Bible in two years journey. Thank you, Lord, that by your spirit, you have been teaching us, edifying us and showing us more of Christ. We pray that we see the fruit of that Lord here at Broadmead um, and in our wider lives and in our city as we live out radically transformed lives with you at the center. We pray for anyone here that's struggling to read your word. May you give them wisdom by your spirit and remind them of the life transforming news that is um, contained there. Encourage them today um, as we hear your word proclaimed to us. Thank you, Lord, for all the hospitality events that have been happening and are ongoing within the church. Um, we thank you that your church community, Lord, is a place where people of different backgrounds and walks can come together, united in Christ. And we pray that all of these events, Lord, would be a testament to that. May you be at the center um, of all these events, Lord, and may it be a witness to others um, looking in. Lord, we thank you for our student community. Um, many of us know that time as a student can be a tricky time, Lord, but also a really joyful time. Um, but we know, Lord, it is an important time for deciding um, your values and priorities in life. Um, and we pray that the students that come here or come to churches across Bristol, Lord, will encounter Jesus um, and see that he is the one that transforms our studies. He transforms our relationships with others um, and ultimately transforms our identity. Um, and in all the highs and lows of being students, Lord, may um, they feel a peace in knowing you um, and find a community at church, Lord. Thinking wider, Lord, for our world, um, we pray for the Middle East right now. Reading the news can make us feel hopeless um, and despairing. But Lord, we know that you are a God who can calm the storm and who has compassion on the hurting, the destitute and the bereaved. Lord, may you bring calm to that troubled region. Um, and may we as Christians um, who live in a relatively safe country, Lord, may we be prompted um, to show Christ's love um, in whatever way you would have us do, Lord, in our prayers and in our actions. Lord, may we see this crisis with Christ-like eyes and give us compassion um, on people who are hurting um, and help us, Lord, to, to get involved in a way that shows Christ. And we pray for Peter and Louise, Lord, um, that out, out in Bangladesh. Um, I pray that they will continue to know the help of God as they minister to the people of Bangladesh. Um, intercede for them, Lord, now, especially as they seek to renew their visas. Um, may they see that you are their provider. Um, and may they look back and remember all the times you have provided before and how your hand has been upon them. Um, and may they um, proclaim, Lord, that you are the great provider again. And finally, Lord, we pray for the preaching of your word in this church. From the Sunday school um, that's going on now to the youth groups that we've heard about already, um, to the home groups, um, we pray that the good news of the gospel continues to go, in, um, to go out week in, week out. We pray now as we come to the preaching of your word. Be with Mark, give him the words to say um, and give us hearts to receive. No matter what our weeks have looked like, Lord, um, no matter all the distractions and the burdens and the joys that we bring in here, Lord, um, by your spirit as your word goes out today, um, may you encourage us, challenge us, 
um, and may we seek to glorify you in our worship um, and in our whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, Great, thanks very much. Well, if you have a Bible, um, now's the time uh, to turn in your Bibles um, to Nehemiah. Um, One of the good things about reading through the Bible in two years is that you start to understand a bit better the order of the books, um, and you can find things that maybe a little bit quicker than you used to be able to. Um, But it's on page 487, if you're in the church Bible. Um, If you're in your own Bibles, um, we're reading Nehemiah, and we're starting from chapter 4. And we'll read the whole of the chapter. So Nehemiah chapter 4. It should be coming up on the screen as well. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall each to our work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people that every man and his helpers stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Mark. I don't know if you're a diary keeper. 
my daughter-in-law is a great journal keeper, and I, I've often thought that'd be a really good thing to do, to kind of keep a, keep a journal of your life and to kind of be able to record, record um, how things are going day by day. So that when you look back, you can see how God has led you and guided you and directed you. However, I'm not, I'm not just not that self-disciplined, really, so it's, it's not something I've been able to do. And also, I, I've always been a little bit worried that if I recorded the, the mundanity of my life, it would look pretty depressing <laughs> because I seem to always be eat, doing the same things, even kind of eating the same breakfast every morning. Um, but what we have in the Bible is a series of different kinds of texts. And what we have in the book of Nehemiah is extracts from his personal diary. Nehemiah is writing his story. He's writing the journey of an important period of his life, a period of his life which had incredible outcomes. And he created a significant change in the course of history. He himself personally had con conducted an activity that changed the direction of history and lives the lives of many people. In life, it is very easy to go with the flow. It is very easy just to drift along with whatever is coming up and to never and always take the path of least resistance. It can be hugely challenging, hugely challenging to try to change something and to go against the flow. If you're part of this church, or you, you know our journey with this building. Sometimes it feels like the building conspires against us. As we arrived this morning, there were three more different things we had to worry about. And it can just be hard if you want to do something that has an impact, that has an eternal impact. But this man, Nehemiah, is not destined to have an easy life, but he is destined to make an impact on the world. Because what he's going to do is he's going to secure the walls and the gates of the city of Jerusalem. In the past, the Babylonians had come and they had torn down the walls and destroyed the temple and taken every gram of gold they could from the city. And then they had exported all of the people that they could find to, um, to Babylon. And so what you're left there is a small group of people, a remnant, who had come back in dribs and drabs. And I think it's worth looking at the historical context of this. Uh, can we just uh, pop up the next slide? Um, it, for some people, this is easy. For people like me, it's not so easy because B.C. means before Christ, okay? So if you think Jesus is the core and the center of the story of all of history, he died and rose again 2,024 years ago. Everything before is before Christ, and everything after is A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And of course, before is, is counting down, and after is counting up. Okay, just you may think, oh, why are you telling us? It's so not it's so you know, so easy for me. But for, for, people, for people like me, it really does my head in. Um, so, but here we go. Abraham is about two thousand years before Jesus. Moses uh, comes out of uh, 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 Egypt. And the Exodus and the conquest is about fourteen hundred years. David is a thousand years before Christ. Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians in 587. Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, uh, decrees the rebuilding of the temple in 538, and the temple is completed in 516. So that's, uh, uh, and, and then Ezra, who we've been reading last week, arrives in 40, 457 BC, and Nehemiah. Nehemiah is going to arrive uh, in 444 BC. And we think that Ezra and Nehemiah are there at the same time. And Ezra and, and Nehemiah and Malachi are there at the same time. Where the geopolitical scene is different than before. The, the world is now being run, or at least this part of the world, by the Mede, Medo-Persian Empire. And this is uh, an empire that is arising out of Iran, what is now known as Iran. And it stretches all the way from India to uh, parts of Greece. Uh, they, they keep trying to attack Greece, and, and it extends all the way over there and through much of North Africa. And this is a massive empire. And we meet Nehemiah in the city of Susa. 
And Sousa is there. Uh, uh, does it say Sousa? Susa is there, yeah, we're, and just above Elam, next to Babylonia. So Susa is the capital city. You can still visit in Iran, and it's there, and he is in that city. His brothers make a journey to Jerusalem. Now remember, there's like a remnant of people there. And they come back and they say, you know what, the situation in Jerusalem is bad. There are big gaps in the walls, and it means that people can, anybody can come in and they can, they can murder, and they can steal, and run away. And the people are kind of lose, losing their will to be there. They want, they're, they're, they're trying to think about different alternatives. The city might be dying. What does Nehemiah do? He is overcome with grief. He weeps. He mourns. He prays. And in that place of brokenness, God gives him a vision. God gives him a solution. God gives him a plan. What do we mean by the word vision? Vision is a preferred future. It is a picture in your mind of how things could be. It is a longing for something that is as yet imaginary, but it actually is transformational. Most people dream with their eyes shut, but people who have a vision dream with their eyes open as they set their gaze on the horizon. And what we want to do this morning is to track the challenges that Nehemiah faces in fulfilling his vision of a rebuilt wall of the city. And we're going to think about what it means for us to have a vision for our life, our personal life, and, and see what obstacles we might be facing in that vision. And then we're going to be thinking about next week about how we ourselves can become part of the problem rather than part of the solution to vision. But it's worth saying now that Nehemiah has an important friend. He has an important friend. He is cupbearer to the king of Persia. So he is daily drinking the, the wine before the king of Persia to make sure there's no kind of poison in it or anything. He has a very close relationship. And so the king of Persia is willing to use his unlimited resources from the India to the Mediterranean and his power, and he's ready to sponsor Nehemiah in this work. But of course, Nehemiah has an even greater friend. He has the author and sustainer of history and the world and who is leading and guiding and directing him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Nehemiah is speaking to us about his vision but actually, it is Jesus this morning who is speaking to us about the vision that he has for our life. As Jeremiah wrote in Babylon, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. But this vision is, is a, it's a challenging situation. Here we have a, a kind of a 3D diagram of what Jerusalem looks like when Nehemiah, when Nehemiah is finished. So when he arrives, a lot of that wall that you see is broken down. And at the top of the picture is the temple area. The temple has been rebuilt uh, under Haggai and others. And on the left, you'll see houses and villages well, those houses would have been part of the old Jerusalem, but now they're not because there's very few people living in Jerusalem, so they don't need that space. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, the, the um, Mount of Olives. You see the olive trees, the Mount of Olives where Jesus used to go. And so he is uh, rebuilding this wall, and it takes about 52 days. But as we've already seen, uh, people can be scornful. Uh, um, I was deeply hurt by what uh, Lindsay had to say there earlier, and I'm, I was quite surprised we let her read the Bible after that, but I'm, I'll leave some prayer after that, but there you go. Um, we're a grace church. <laughs> but uh, Sambalat says, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? 
Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing over it, will break down their wall of stones. Israel is only one group amongst many in that situation. They are no longer the ruling organization at that time. Sanballat, we know from history, was governor uh, of the Samaritan Samaria area to the north of Israel. And he and his people had been brought by the Assyrians a few hundred years before and settled in that area. He was not a Jew. Um, Tobiah is an Ammonite, which means he comes from Transjordan, what we call Jordan today, the country of Jordan today. And Geshem is, a, is a, a, an Arab, maybe from Saudi Arabia. None of these guys have any business in Jerusalem. They have no business being in Jerusalem. They have their own area. And no one, and they did not want to see the city prosper. Having a weak Jerusalem is very handy for them. In fact, Tobiah had cronies in the priesthood, and, he, and they let him store his possessions in the place where the, where the offerings were, were supposed to be kept, in the temple. And uh, it'd be like someone coming to me and saying, can I, can I store my three-piece suite in the hazard room where the kids are playing? But no, not for your three-piece suite. It's for the church to enjoy and to use. And we see not only was he scorning the work of God, but his friends in the priesthood were scorning the work of God. So what does Nehemiah do? First thing, he throws out to buy his rubbish. And then he prays. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. He brings the issue to prayer. He asks God to intervene. And as, a, as someone who's been working in, 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 in serving in church for many, many years, and especially here in, in Broadmead, we have found that's the only solution. That is the only solution to getting things done. Praying. The prayer meeting. Praying and fasting. Calling on God. We try many other things, and we try to, to, to get things fixed, but actually it's prayer that does God's work. Prayer and prayer alone. And now we rebuilt, we, we're reading verse 6, we rebuilt the wall until it all reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. In the fresh flow of enthusiasm, they build it all to half the height it should be. But then the scorn is ramped up, and they have to deal with uh, discouragement again. And there are three main sources of discouragement. Firstly, we see uh, the people say, in the strength of the laborers is giving out, there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. They've been getting up early, they've been working late at night, and they're around, they're trying to build this wall, but everywhere there are piles of stones from the old wall. And so they're maybe trying to pick some of those stones up and use them, but some of them are, are impossible to use. And so it's the rubble all around that is discouraging them. And, but it's, and it's not really a physical tiredness, although that is there too, but it's more of a loss of momentum. And, and that's prompted not only by the stones being there and the, the rocks, but something more. Verse 7, When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Also, our enemy says, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them. We will kill them and put an end to their work. Not only are they now laughing at the builders, but they're saying, we're going to come and cut your throat. We're going to come and kill you. And so the builders not only have a pile of rocks to sort out, but now they're being, their very life is being threatened. But it's something more than that. It's in, in um, verse 12. And the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever that you turn, they will attack us. The people, the Jewish people living outside of the city come and say, hey, at least you've got a bit of a wall. If you build a wall, they will attack us, and they'll kill us. 
and ten times the people who are living outside the city who, are, who should be on the same side are discouraging the builders. There's a whole range of situations that is calling, causing discouragement. So what does Nehemiah do? He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't carry blithely on and say, well, okay, you do what are you going to do. I'm going to keep doing this. No, he's aware of the discouragement and he responds to it in an appropriate way. So first he says, uh, I stationed, verse 13, some of my people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families. And then verse 14, he says, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, and your wives and your home. He says, right. He organizes the people, and he says, remember who is doing this. This vision is not a vision from me. It's a vision from God. And Jesus is pushing forward this vision for our city. And verse 15, we read that the enemies heard that, that the plot had been discovered, and God had frustrated it, and they kind of went away, and everyone carried on building. When people get discouraged in the, in the vision, they do. People can get discouraged. And maybe you feel discouraged in your life as a Christian. Maybe you feel, oh, you know, things aren't going very well. And I'm struggling here. And I don't know why I have all these problems. And why isn't Jesus helping me with this? Why isn't Jesus changing that situation? Why isn't Jesus producing this? It's very easy to say to someone like that, oh, well, just take a holiday then. Go, go sit on the sofa. Just, just relax for a little bit. But he doesn't do that. He supports the people who are struggling. He reminds them of who they are working for. And he reminds them of who is actually doing the work. Jesus is doing the work. He doesn't buy into this negativity. And he doesn't buy into the intimidation. The work continues. And because Nehemiah has the courage to personally speak to people and challenge them and encourage them into that ministry, the work continues. Maybe not with that initial burn of enthusiasm, but people have a, are deepening. They're deepening in their understanding. And as they enter into the business of building the wall, they discover that they themselves are being transformed. The best response that we can make to people who are discouraged is say, listen, God's at work here, get involved. And you will discover some incredible, amazing thing about what it means to serve Jesus as you serve him with God's people. And then we see that they also put other safeguards into place. Verse 17. Uh, people carried materials and did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore a sword at his side and as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continue with the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. The builders are building, but they're also packing. They're packing a weapon on the side and they're building the, city, the wall as it goes. And if there's an attack in one part of the wall, the trumpet will sound and everyone will hear and they'll rush and defend the wall there. And they've discovered the power of teamwork. They've discovered the power of having people around who have the same goals as you. As I was saying to the young people in years, whatever it is, to you, whatever it is, um, you need to have people around you who are working with you. You need to have people around you who, who, who hold on to the same values as you do and are working with you. And they discover that one plus one in that context does not equal two. One plus one equals five or ten. Two people working together can achieve an incredible amount. Three people working together can achieve an astounding amount. Two hundred people working together, the world can't even stop that. Two hundred people working together can achieve incredible outcomes. Here, even here, we could achieve incredible outcomes. And he says, rely on the sword. Not the physical sword, but the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Listen for the trumpet of the King. Listen for Him calling. And get your trowel out. And keep going with whatever job He's giving you to do now. 
And finally, what we're seeing here is true leadership. Look at verse 23. Neither I nor my brothers nor the men nor the guards with me took off their clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Nehemiah says, look at me and, and follow my example. He doesn't say, do as I say. He says, do as I do. And he and his men, for 52 days, don't change their clothes too much. And even when they go to the toilet, they got their sword there, and they're good to go. Uh, and they barely slept, and they barely changed their clothes. And he showed people, by his own example, what they should be doing. Now, you may say, well, this is all very interesting, but how does that affect me? Let me speak first about Broadmead. Let me speak first about this church here. We have a vision. And that vision has several fronts, and I'm not going to go into them all. But our vision is that everybody who is part of this fellowship, who comes here and makes their home here, is encouraged and strengthened and learns to live out the Christian life not on the basis of someone pushing them or dragging them, but through the experience of finding that the Christian life is the best way to live their life. When, my, my, when one of my sons was, was, a, was a baby, was a two-year-old, I'd, I'd be in bed in, in the morning, and he would come in, and this isn't Sam, this is the other one. And so just in case, yeah, it's not Sam. Um, he would come very close, and he would say, Daddy, what? Daddy, huh. breakfast! <laughs> and I'd jump out of bed, and I'd be making the breakfast for him. Now, he's, he's 35. And uh, they're staying over, they're staying, he and his wife were at my ho- our house last night, and I came down this morning, and I figured out he'd already made breakfast all by himself. There was a dirty place in the sink, and the, the bread was open, and the knife was, it, okay, he doesn't need me to make breakfast for him anymore, he just did a pretty good job of doing it for himself this morning, except for cleaning up, of course. And, and that is our plan. Our plan is that you come here, and you're here a year, two years, three years, 20 years, 30 years. We don't know. But that you learn in this context what it means that to 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 live the life that the Bible teaches you should live. And learn that it works. And learn that it's joyful. And learn that it's successful. And learn that it's transformational. And learn that it brings a whole situation that you could never imagine before. And that whether you stay here or you go somewhere else, you take that understanding and you share it with somebody else. That is pretty much the beginning and the end of what we're trying to do here at Broadmead. And we would love to invite you to be part of that. We would like you to be part of home group. On the 3rd of November, we're going to have a Building on the Rock session on being a member. And we would like to invite you to be part of that because being a member means that you are able to serve in a more effective way. You're able to lead you're able to encourage others and have a position of responsibility. And so we would encourage you not only to attend here, but to become a member here. And I'm saying all of this because, as I said to the young people, and I'm saying to you now, God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. You are not just born to live your life in some kind of vacuum. You are not just born to accumulate wealth. You are not just born just to go with the flow. He was God has chosen a life for you. And this life is of confidence and joy. It's about relationships with others, which are strong and lasting. The ability to turn around and say, I've been friends with this person for 25 years, and we still love each other, and we're still good friends. It is about having light shine into your lives and the lives of others. It's about families of physical or spiritual children. It's about living a life which is on a pilgrimage, and wherever you go, springs of water emerge. This is the purpose of your life. This is the plan for your life. And it's so beautiful. It takes your breath away. It's so wonderful. It's so joyful that it gets you through all kinds of situations. In fact, a life without vision is a life that's already on the way to the grave. 
A life with vision is a life that's transformational. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychologist, and uh, he was Jewish. And uh, during the Second World War, he was taken off to Auschwitz. And he wrote a book called The Meaning of Life, or uh, uh, no, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Man's Search for Meaning. And he said in the camp, there were two types of people. One type of person who is just antagonistic towards everybody, just out for themselves, just taking care of themselves, not thinking about anybody else. He said there were other types of people who would share, and they would go around the hut in the evening, say, are you okay? Have you had a good day? And they'd be reaching out to people. The first type of person, you would find one day that they were not going to, to, to the work, but they were staying in the hut, and they were smoking their whole cigarette ration. They were smoking all the cigarettes. Just chain smoking them away. And as you left the hut, you would say to other people, they'll be dead in the morning. And they were. And they were. Because they just given up. But he said the people who were sharing and caring and loving in Auschwitz were ironically the people who walked out of the gate at the end of the war. Isn't that interesting? The power of vision. And I would be lying to you if I said it was straightforward. I would be lying to you if I said it was easy, because it's not. That there aren't discouragements and there aren't temptations. But you have to scorn the scorn. See, a statement of vision is a, a statement of discontentment with the status quo. A statement of vision is saying things could be different, things could be better. And when you say that kind of thing, it really annoys people. It really makes people angry, especially if they have some kind of stake in the way things are. When I drive to, to church on Sunday morning, we drive uh, along the M32, and there's some, a lot of graffiti on the, on the wall, and it seems some, some people do Jesus graffiti. I'm not, I'm not sure if I agree with that, but there's some Jesus graffiti. But there's also a sign that someone has sprayed there, call in sick. Call in sick. Don't go to work today. Call in sick. And as I drive back, I, I think that's the most awful message you can give to people. That's the most terrible thing you can say. Just lie on the sofa and watch Netflix. Because nothing really matters. People will be af- laugh at you if you have a, vi- a, a vision. Deal with discouragement. If you have a vision, you're going to be working. And you're going to get tired. You're going to have to deal with negativity from other people. You're going to have to deal with people disagreeing with you. You have to deal with physical obstacles. And before you know it, if you, let in, if you let that discouragement in, you become part of the problem. You're no longer part of the solution. So when that happens, you have to make a conscious choice. You have to talk to yourself. You have to remind yourself that there's a city that you're building, and that city isn't a physical city. It is a glorious, eternal city where you're going to live. Keep the sword and the trowel handy. Keep God's word, the sword of the Spirit, handy. Keep it going into your heart. Keep it speaking into you. Whether you say, well, I don't, I don't really feel like reading the Bible today. Read the Bible anyway, whether you feel like it or don't. Pray anyway, whether you feel like it or don't. Keep doing those things because those things are the means of grace for you to have the strength to, to work through discouragement. Keep the trial going. Be faithful in your ministry. And most of all, focus on the perfect leader. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, says Hebrews, the author, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. He was taken outside the city wall. He was taken to the dunghill outside the city wall. And there he was crucified. And he did not scorn the cross, but he embraced the cross because he knew that victory over the cross was coming. He died to our old life and our old behavior patterns so now he can live with him and be part of that city that he is building. He's so good. He's so amazing. He's so beautiful. His plan is so wonderful. Are you ready for what Jesus has for you to do? Are you ready for to be the person Jesus wants you to be? This morning, we've had Kate, who's served faithfully 
And a vision has caught her heart, and we're encouraging her in that vision. We've had old and Sarah, empty nesters. It was funny. Empty nesters. And they're now saying, well, what does the next 10 years look like to us? We've had Noah, who loves the young people, wants to serve them. We've had Dylan, who's going to be part of the pastoral heart of this church. These people have said, yes, this is what God has for us, and we're going to lay hold of it, even if it's difficult. Will you do the same? Will you lay hold of the vision that God has for your life? Will you turn, turn your back on other things that take you away from that vision? Will you scorn the scorn? Will you fight discouragement? Will you look at Jesus and put your trust in him and welcome his kingdom for you? Because he has so much for us. And I, I think, I mean, I, well, I wonder if we could pray together this morning. I wonder if you join me in a little prayer as we pray that God will make this happen true in our lives. We're going to be asking God to establish, give us a vision for our lives. And I want to encourage you to pray with me. So if you're happy to pray, I'll pray one line and then just please pray after me if that's okay. We praise you, Father God, for your plan of salvation. We thank you, Jesus, that you came to save us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to guide us into your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you've never said a prayer like that. If you haven't, just put your hand up. We would love to give you a little list of of promises that God has for you. If you've never said a prayer like that before, but you would like to receive this, put your hand up now and Camardo will uh, come and share this with you. God bless you. Why don't we um, just have a moment of quiet as we as we reflect on what we've what we've listened to? In a moment, we're going to be singing about exactly that. May the Lord establish our vision, and may it be on Him um, as we sing a couple of songs to close. But why don't we just take a moment in our own hearts, and then we'll stand and sing together. We're going to um, stand in just a moment. Let me encourage you, if you'd like to, to pray with someone, there will be people at the back in the corner there, the prayer team. Please do go and make use of that. But we're going to sing a couple of songs to finish about um, our, a prayer that, that the Lord would be our vision. Um, and then, O oh, Church Arise, that talks again about our call to war, um, just like Nehemiah. Uh, but this is a war that we are fighting um, to rage against a captor, um, a war where we want to love those around us, we want to love with the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's stand and let's sing together. Sing, be thou my vision. Be thou my vision.
Sing, O church, rise. O church, rise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With a shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the death. Trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure, and Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. See his foes like crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen, and as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, his victory march continues till the day, every eye and heart shall see. Spirit come and strength in every shrine, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful, as saints of all still line the way, returning triumphs of Let's um, pray as we stand. Father, we thank you for what we've heard today. We thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for our lives. Thank you that you have a purpose for every single person in this room. And Father, we just pray that we would look to you as our vision. We'd look to you for our strength. Father, that we would um, wear the armor of God. Lord, as we read your word, we fight with the sword. And Father, we do pray that we would hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Thank you, Lord. Uh, for how amazing that will be. And we just pray that that would fill us with joy this week as we go out into all types of weeks that we have. Father, please be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please have a seat. And just as we close, just a, a, a verse from Romans 15. says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you again for being with us today. Um, please do continue those conversations. Tea and coffee is through there. Um, collect your children and have a great rest of the week.